The last time I preached here was 25 years ago. It was March 1998, and I was a pre-candidate for the ministry at the First Unitarian Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Wow, one of you called it this my Silver Sunday anniversary then, and it must be the case. I think, too, it's been an amazing journey to arrive here, not only the 25 years since I was last year, but as I drove here this morning in quite heavy rain, it is possible, no, frankly, it's true that I went the wrong way down a one-way in Indianapolis. <laughs> And A, no one hit me, and B, no one honked. They were so kind. <laughs> and then when I came to use the restroom, it is possible but true that apparently they're newly gender neutral to you and you have a memory of what gender goes where, but as a visitor, I just wandered in and then a man came in and was like, oh, uh, and, 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 and we had this funny moment. And I laughed for like five minutes because I didn't know if I was in the right restroom, and he didn't know either, and we figured it out. We were both in the right place, which seemed completely odd. And a child waved to me up front during the story for all ages, which was the sweetest welcoming I've had. And someone shared this book with me in relation to the sermon I'm going to preach, Finding Much Miss how to add more life to life, and it's delightful. I'm also aware that your beloved minister, the Reverend Jamie Hinson Rieger, is not up here this morning, and there's an absence then among you. And all of this, all of this amazes me. And I choose to be married to amazement. I chose other ideas first. I tried preparing for the worst. That's an oldie but goodie from my childhood. And interestingly, though, it didn't protect me from what could and did go wrong. Turns out I was frankly not imaginative enough. Beyond that, it was exhausting, depressing. I had to remain vigilant, focused on doomed potential futures. After that, though, I tried denial, and that got me into flat-out trouble, not attending to the obvious and the necessary. Much later, I'm older than I look, much later, I chose a middle way, aware of the valley of loss and pain on one side, always with us, and every gift and opportunity on the other side, also always with us. And between them rests this middle, a chosen path of present, presence, wonder, gratitude, amazement. One thing I learned from serving in parish ministry for 19 years is that as the great Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel said in his Yom Kippur essay, Scratch the skin of any person and you come upon sorrow, frustration, unhappiness. People are pretentious. Everybody looks proud inside. They are heartbroken. From inside the seat of parish ministry, I watched apparently successful members and their families struggle with life-threatening illnesses, addictions, affairs, financial ruin, traumatic injury and accidents, dementia, and even death of children, which is something I will just never understand nor accept, yet I know it is true. It can all happen. It does all happen. I have been with people as it happened. And it was from this seat with these teachers journeying with them that I learned I could never prepare for all the possibilities, nor know which ones to expect when, if ever, might become part of my personal story. Early in my ministry, I visited a couple, an older couple in the hospital. You must imagine baby minister me, 30 years old, no gray hair, looked about 24, not yet ordained in a chaplain residency program. 
It was the 90s, I'm sure I had something oversized on. The woman said to me, looking at her dying husband, how could this happen to us? We were missionaries. And I remember simultaneously thinking, death is inevitable and uncontrollable, a hungry bear in autumn, and that no good works nor benevolent God offers immortality in this life. And I also realized as I looked at her grief-stricken face, there was nothing for me to say other than, I am so sorry, this must be really hard for you. Bad things happen to good people and wonderful things happen to people who behave very badly. From this I have concluded that neither I nor anyone else is fully in control. Rather, we are in a river of life and there are floods and droughts and lazy calm days and typhoons. We can put up some guardrails like life insurance and wills and health insurance and such. We can ask for help as often as we need it, even to the annoyance, which we should, of medical providers, therapists, and financial planners. But when the lights go out, when the hungry bear comes, we will not have prepared for everything. Attempting to be fully prepared is exhausting. It requires, as I mentioned, that constant depressing vigilance, imagining future harms. It's a hard, deadening way to live and a great way to ruin the possibly beautiful now, which included me laughing for five minutes when someone walked in the bathroom and we couldn't figure out who should be there and if we both belong there and then what to do, right? It was like all the societal norms got tossed upside down and I found it delightful as much as I had no idea how to proceed. A few years ago, I took part in a local leadership program. We were asked to do an exercise that I hated we were instructed to walk around to 30 people we had just met to look them in the eye and say either I trust you or I don't trust you. I know, terrible. I know neither the benefit nor purpose of this exercise. Don't repeat it at home. <laughs> I certainly remember its multiple cringeworthy moments and the response of one classmate, one classmate. This classmate, the shortest man in the class, one who could be considered vulnerable given his size, who had to look up to everyone, said, I trust you. When the instructor later asked him why he did this, he replied, it doesn't matter if I trust you. I trust myself. And I trust myself to figure it out. So I trust you. He changed the frame of the entire exercise to empower himself. Much later, I learned that he grew up as an immigrant in a biracial family amidst poverty and multiple challenges, and then he made some serious mistakes, serious adult mistakes. And he figured it out. These days, he does not waste time remaining vigilant and worrying about the future. He chooses to name his frame and believes that when problems arise, he's going to figure it out. So he chooses to live loud and proud in the present and have fun. It's a choice he makes not based on ignorance, but on knowledge and commitment to the present. It is amazing to me how one awkward exercise could unexpectedly teach me the importance of choosing my own frame. What I learned from all these teachers I just told you about is to love the now, to dig deeply into it, to savor it, to make time for fun and family and friends, building community, living one's own joy in one's own way. When I became a minister, I used to see this quote by the writer and literature professor Joseph Campbell everywhere I turned, follow your bliss. I don't see this quote so much anymore, but Campbell was on to something. In the words of theologian and civil rights activist, Howard Thurman, don't ask what the world needs, 
Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And what makes me come alive not only is shouting children, truly, that's why I went down for the children's story, I love watching the children, is wonder. And I find it in the present, the internal now. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from its purse to buy me and snaps that purse shut, when death comes like measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what's it going to be like and therefore, I look upon everything as a siblinghood, and I look upon time as no more than an idea, and I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular, and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does toward silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was married to amazement. I took the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I've made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. I want to be married to amazement and take the world in my arms. And I know, because <laughs> I have been alive, that this is even harder to do in the last six years than it was in the six before them. I want to go out and submerge myself in wonder. So when I go out walking, I consider sight, sound, smell, sense, sky, and stance. It's a walking meditation I learned from my colleague, the Reverend Phil Lund. So I look at my surroundings and I listen. I inhale deeply. I realized I, I don't smell well. I'm a bad smeller. I feel the air on my skin. Is it humid, crisp, or cold? I look at the sky and I feel my body. You know, and please, if you try this, adapt this exercise to whatever level of mobility and sensory function available to you. So I used to walk with my head down, lost in thought, generally about the past or the future. Remember, I was trying to prepare for it all. And with this exercise, I'm actually in the present. You know, I have to look at the sky. I, I inhale. I smell rain in the air or decaying earth that lets me know summer is ending. I experience the quality of the air. I see the leaves change and bud. When walking with me, one needs to put up with the shouts of delight as I see things or hear them or smell them. I was recently walking with a woman from Iowa and we passed a cornfield and I'm like, oh, look at the cornfield, it's so beautiful. And she's like, Sharon, I'm from Iowa, and I'm like, I'm from Ohio. There's a lot of corn. It's still gorgeous, really, whether it's like stubbly and short or like gold or green. It's extraordinary. Sometimes when I check my stance, I find myself limping. Mm -hmm. And when this happens, I check in more deeply with how it is with my body. And at least once on every walk, I look at the sky. Is it clear blue or foggy or fully overcast? Or just are there puffy evening clouds with that like breakthrough last shaft of pink? It's when I look at the sky, actually, that I have the most wonder. And I think what a gift it is to be alive and how everything changes. Every walk is a new discovery, a new adventure even if it is on the same path. And I am reminded that every moment passes, every moment, the bad ones, when your wisdom teeth come out, the good ones, 
when you get married or a child is born, the great ones too, you win the Pulitzer Prize. It's taught me to be more grateful for what is and to remember that nothing lasts. So honor now and give and receive love where I find it. I remind myself that nothing is given and I reach out for the present. And I don't want to mislead you into thinking that because I choose wonder, it is all wonderful all the time. Please don't imagine that. My neck hurts today a lot. I have loss and grief. I wake sometimes in the night unable to sleep. I know I'm not alone. I'm scared about the state of American democracy. I'm scared about the war in Ukraine. I worry about deforestation and species extinction, armed rebel in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country I love, and my spectacularly crabby, failing, difficult mother. Yeah, I'm just like you. While writing this sermon, I learned that a dear friend from long ago had died. He had actually died three years ago, but because of the pandemic, I didn't know. And I was overwhelmed. How could he have died? He was only 53 at the time. Someone who changed my life for good is now gone, and I too am scared and frankly heartbroken, right? We live in heartbreaking times. 19th century essayist and philosopher Henry David Thoreau wrote about wanting to, quote, suck out all the marrow of life. For him, this included living a quiet, self-reliant life on Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. Though I need to say he wasn't totally self-reliant and he relied a lot on his friends while he was out there. Just know that. <laughs> My definition is a bit different, but I too understand wanting to suck the marrow out of life in my own chosen way. I recently watched a video by slam poet Andrea Gibson, who I find so inspirational. In it, they speak of going home with a woman and before their first kiss, the woman runs to get a stethoscope so that Andrea can hear the woman's heartbeat faster as they kiss. The story is just so beautiful to me. What a delightful way to suck the marrow out of life with one kiss. It's so present, so simple, so possible. You don't need money or an elaborate travel plan or a Rolex watch. You just need the moment so blissful and so alive. Here's a tweet from Indian Andrea Gibson from last fall. I quote, awkwardness is my new drug of choice. Nothing gets me higher than uncomfortable situations. In today's newsletter, I wrote about how I've been on a mission to embarrass myself regularly. Have a beautifully awkward day, everyone, heart emoji. And her newsletter from September 13th, 2022, contains this story. Years ago, on tour in Europe, my friends and I dared our friend Katie to walk through a crowded travel plaza with a 20-foot strand of toilet paper dragging from her shoe, complaining loudly in a deep Midwestern accent about how there was no place in the world good as America. She made a humiliating spectacle of herself and we were high on that embarrassment for days. Okay, so this is my worry of what might happen to me without planning it. <laughs> so to have someone have planned it is just terrific. I love this story. I love Andrea for sharing this story. And Andrea has had this spring She's in her 40s, I believe, a rare reoccurrence of cancer. So you see. <laughs> it's wonderful and terrible, right? And all amazing. There are so many ways to live in wonder, in bliss, to be alive as the world collides around us. It spins and weaves. I hope for each of us, to take care during these hard times, truly take care. Reach for the present wonder as often as possible. 
maybe even experiment with humiliating spectacles and awkwardness. I think that was my moment in the restroom this morning, which is why I laughed so long. It like made my day. However you do it, make it a great day. May it be an amazing day and may it always be so. And please rise now in body or spirit, however you would like, choose, or not prefer, and join in singing number 38, Morning Has Broken. Please be seated. Would that be what you do now? Please be seated, even if it isn't. <laughs> Wonderful. The screen doesn't work. It's fantastic. I love it. Just a reminder, we are having coffee hour immediately after this service in the social hall and virtual coffee hour on Zoom. I hope you will stay and enjoy. And now we extinguish the flame of our chalice, but not the light of understanding, and never the warmth of compassion which we need, or the fire of our commitment which will keep us warm when it is cold. Let us keep those with us until we meet again and go in peace. <laughs>